Hi, I'm Benjamin Morse, creator of We Are Scarlet Twilight and August Purgatory Underground. You can find my campaigns at Zoop, and you can find me on Twitter at Benjamin W. Morse. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to another episode of Rapid Fire. The concept is simple. It is a one-on-one -on -one style interview like inside the actor's studio back in the day. And so who is our guest today? Our guest today is a comic book writer and creator and a very talented individual at that, Michael S. Katz, that actually recommended him to the show itself. So thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. We are joined by the ever talented Benjamin Rose. How are you doing today? Pretty good, Kurt. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm the writer and artist of a book called We Are Scarlet Twilight, which is live on Zoop now. I've been working on another book called August Purgatory Underground that came out earlier this year, last year, I'm sorry, with Red 5 Comics. What I try to bring to the table as a creator is generally try to put together stories that are really reader focused, uh, kind of keep an eye on good momentum, good artwork, um, just the type of things that I think comic readers want to see more of. Well, then what is We Are Scarlet Twilight all about? Because from what I've read, it's it's beautiful. I mean, I love the story. I love the concept. Everything is just incredible. But what is Scarlet Twilight all about? So Scarlet Twilight is the starts out as the adventures of a classic old school crime fighter from the 1930s. He does have kind of a dark secret uh, that he's holding back that you learn a little bit about in issue one. Uh, he makes a pretty big mistake, though, at the end of issue one and ends up in the distant future a few centuries later and finds that his greatest enemy is now running the world. And uh, basically, humanity is enslaved by a cult of evil vampires. So when he wakes up, he's uh, he's got his assistant still with him somehow, his sidekick, and he and his uh, his friends have to figure out how to put everything back the way it should be. That's something I find interesting is is the time travel motif that motif and theme when it comes to comics. You know, some some do it extremely well, others not so well. But from what I read with, of course, the comic series, I'd love your transition to it. I love the time travel jump itself too. Uh, got a sense of the world at least from what I got to read. I'm not going to spoil it for those that are want to support obviously the the campaign on Zoop there, but. What is it about the time travel motif that can be done really well and really poorly when it comes to comics? Well, I think when it's done well, it's it's fun. It adds to the story. It lets you get to something better than you would have had by just staying in one kind of set linear timeline. I think when it's done poorly, it's a get out of jail free card for your plots or for your characters. Um, in my case, for Scarlet Twilight, I kind of wanted to really go crazy with the architecture and the sort of art deco Batman animated series feel that I tried to give the book. Going to the future, yeah, I kind of cribbed that from Buck Rogers. It was, gave me an excuse to get into the future, have sort of art deco plus architecture so I could go crazy with it, have not just big buildings like you'd see in Manhattan, but giant buildings like you'd see in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's the one thing I noticed. But I was just like, this is very like Tim Bruce ish style, and um, just it was just incredible to see overall. You've already touched on your inspiration, of course, with Batman the Animated Series with this particular series here. What excites you about being creative in writing this series? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? I hope this doesn't seem like a cop out, but it's it's really the whole thing. The ideas I had that kind of got me going on this book were a combination of a few plots I had that I thought were interesting, but didn't quite work well enough to support an entire series. So kind of coming up with some things I thought would work together, but then added up to be enough and to be fun. Uh, I, I kind of got to sit back and focus purely on momentum. I had about five concepts I knew I wanted to take through a story. I had... Um, you know, obviously kind of want to stick to a three-act structure with something with a miniseries. So it became really a process of putting a lot of different elements on my table like a puzzle and putting them together. So I, I, I think it was kind of fun to assemble a story in that way, which is not normally how I do it. Um, and it let me focus uh, much more on just the reader experience when I'm dropping certain plot points when I'm putting little mysteries out there, when I'm resolving them, what those lead to, it got to be really uh, easy to focus on just the roller coaster ride aspect of it, uh, which I think is a really good way to do it. It lets you focus on the reader and their experience rather than just kind of letting your characters drag you around, which I've 
been guilty of getting caught up in. So then speaking of fan reactions, how has it been not only for the campaign itself, but for maybe past issues that they have left comments on or, or about when they've seen you at conventions? Well, luckily, people have really liked the twists. Uh, I'm also surprised and really happy that a lot of the mysteries I kind of put out there uh, seem to be the right amount of breadcrumbs to the truth about certain characters. So I, the, the main character, Captain Lancet, is actually a pretty well-known historical figure. And people got the hints about that right about at the right time, you know, when I'd look at people posting about it on Twitter or asking me questions about it. So that was really gratifying. I normally think I'm being the right amount of, you know, giving me the right amount of information. Uh, sometimes I'm too subtle. Sometimes it's a little too over the top. But everything, for the most part, has really landed. Uh, and I, I think that's a function, uh, my guess is, uh, because I was just able to focus on the pacing with this one a lot more than some of my other stories. I will say there is one really big hint about the next uh, book and kind of ties into Captain Lancet's origins that no one has figured out yet. And uh, I'm kind of curious to see if someone will in the next few months. Looking at yourself as a creative person, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, that's a good question. I would say one of my favorite things that I've read in a story that really hit me was a few things in, and I'm going to maybe just cheat a little bit to talk about comic book language. There was a sequence, I've always loved comic books as a kid, but there was a sequence in, I think, Steve Rude and Dave Gibbons' World Finest series where you see Batman apprehending some of the Joker's henchmen type guys at the beginning of the story. It's a bit of a throwaway scene. It's mostly plays out quietly as the henchman takes some kind of poison to avoid talking to Batman. It really disturbed me. I think I was maybe 10 at the time. It stuck with me and really kind of frightened me, but it also has stayed with me in a lot of ways. Really opened my eyes to a silent scene with a very little dialogue, giving you time information about the main characters in the scene, which is Batman and the other guy, the other people being chased, and the Joker who's not even there. I, I thought that had so much menace and, and just real intensity to it. And that's one of the things that kind of opened my eyes to the comic book language. I realized, wow, they did this in a weird way. And it really, really added to the experience. What challenges do comic creators still face today that needs to be addressed in the industry? I'd say there's a lot of challenges, and I don't think it would be a surprise to anyone that the main one is just how fast things are changing. We're stuck in a point where, as writers and artists, we really want to give all of our time to these projects. We love them. I assume most people that make comics feel that way. At the same time, we look at crowdfunding platforms. One is good for a while, then it becomes problematic in some way. But that's a lot for a creator to keep track of in addition to, you know, making an entire book. And I think that also managing teams is really difficult. That's something I'm a little lucky I don't have to deal with because I can draw it myself. But uh, there's a lot of challenges I think didn't exist back. And I, I also think back in my other job as a graphic designer, I would hear stories from people I work with about how things were so different back in the 70s and 80s. You could get away with a lot, I would say, in terms of not really wanting to work that hard. Not that anyone should want to do those things, but you can't get away with any of that now. Not that you should want to. I think the same principle is true of comics. You could probably get away back in the day if you were good artists with just not working too hard. It was all, all was from America. It wasn't as easy to compete with everyone in the world. You could coast by a little bit, I think, and still be in the industry and do pretty well. I think today it's so much harder to get in, to stay in, to keep an eye on not what you're just doing now, but what you need to be doing in a year. So there's a lot of challenge. I think with those, they always say it's an opportunity as well. And I think that's true of this. There's a lot of good and bad. It takes up a lot of time. You do have opportunities to do things that are more geared to your lifestyle, the time you can spend on the project, do things that way. So I think something has become much more difficult. I think artists have to do a lot more, but it also has opportunities for us to control a lot more as well. Being a graphic designer and then creating comics, did you take from graphic design, what did you bring into the comic industry? Well, I'd say two things that kind of separate. One is, I would say, soft, uh, being able to email coherently, you know, uh, with other people that you're, you know, collaborating. Just having good social skills in a business uh, is something I've been lucky to learn from my colleagues and brought to my way getting through. I'd say the, the way I've approached page layouts is very much what I'm doing when I design something for a catalog. Uh, I generally leave negative space on one panel. I want to make sure the entire page is a nice shape before I really get into, you know, really nitty gritty details. Uh, in addition, uh, I usually coloring the page and not coloring. And that really helps things hang. And it, until that clicked with me and it, uh, my colors were not working out very well. I'm pretty happy with them now. And it, I, I, this is a, this page is the image you're coloring, not this. 
And once I started to learn to do that a little more, and that's definitely a graphic, uh, things became a lot easier for me. Is there a, a graphic designer that you uh, idolized or maybe emulated that you brought over to your comic roots? Oh, yes. He does those books with Alex Ross, a few on his own. He did a collection called Bat Manga. Uh, his design, I think he's done the book cover for Jurassic Park as well, which I think is what he's most famous. But his work with DC is so cool. And there is something about those images and his layouts and his, that whether I'm looking at Alex Ross, uh, older you know, memorabilia, of Superman or Batman or other DC characters. There's something about the way he presents that capture everything that's good about older comics, newer comics, the comic length. I mean, I read those books and I usually just put them down because I feel like going back to my desk. So I think there's something about his design that has such an appreciation of the, the, the punchiness of comics. It's a, and, uh, actually his work was a big inspiration creating Scarlet Twilight. I looked at how he presents some of the older imagery in his, and thought there's a really nice mix of modern and old stuff here that amp, and that was kind of my guiding principle in creating Scarlet Twilight. There's a lot of crowdfunding platforms out there. Obviously we know we have Kickstarter, we have Zoop, we have crowdfunder without the E. What does Zoop offer you that maybe the other platforms aren't quite there yet? Well, the big draw for me that, that brought me to Zoop was I was intrigued months ago, I'd say about a year or two ago at this point, uh, I love that they were comics focused. That was the main thing. You could tell these people were comics fans, were in the comic industry, everything about it was focused on comics and you don't get that in Kickstarter. I think that while they have a great comic section, there's something about it. You know, it's always going to be more focused on the games and the things that bring in bigger amounts or you know, more famous campaigns, things like that. Comics at Zoop is the real focus. And I, I liked that. What brought me there for this campaign is when I was trying to fulfill number three and finish it up, even I was getting really far behind. I was trying to set up printers, set up shipping costs, make sure I wasn't the planning of the campaign took a long time because I'm sitting there trying to figure out how much is shipping going to change over the next few months. And then of course, the more you slow down, the more things will change in the time frame it takes you to do it. So that was my first concern there was just about the support I've gotten in this series has been so overwhelming. I feel really bad having anybody wait uh, longer than they should have to, to be able to read it. So that's obviously the biggest thing. And then secondly, like I said, logistically, I had to look at this and figure out a way to do it better because shipping costs are going up and down. Paper costs are going up and down. Printer turnaround time is going up and down. So is it harder for me to do that and to create the entire book? But I almost feel like so much of your planning is negated when you're doing all the planning because it's going to then take that much more time and everything's going to continue to change. So that was the biggest thing that brought me there. I thought I owed it to my backers to just find a better way to do this. And I'm happy to say the team there has been amazing. They're incredibly passionate about comics. They're really knowledgeable about the industry, about crowdfunding in particular. They have just a great resource. They have great resources with printing, with setting up, you know, relationships with people that write about comics and ways to get the word out. So I can't say enough good things. And I think the best thing I can say to backers is just being able to focus on creating the artwork and writing. I'm three pages from being done on this as of, you know, the day after launch, I'm going to be done probably this week. Uh, that's huge. That hasn't been where I've been out in any of these campaigns because I'm busy trying to figure out what printing is going to cost in, you know, four months. So. Uh, that's been a huge boon and it's going to let me get these books out a lot faster. Um, like this will be done well before the campaign ends. So, uh, I think that's the best, the proof is in the pudding there. It's been a real boon to the process. Everyone usually asks what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received, but what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Uh, let's see. I would say the best piece of advice is from my boss. When I first started working uh, out of college, I was an illustration firm. My boss there was not a great businessman, but he was an illustrator who had kind of been with a different company a long time. And when that folded, started his own company with a few other people that was kind of picking up the pieces of that older firm. And he was sitting down drawing a children's book for his church. And he was drawing a sort of pilot, a kid being a pilot in the plane. And the plane was, it was about an 11 by 17 piece of horizontal artwork. And he was drawing the plane with a, with a marker and he just did this perfect line across the uh, surface. It was a perfect curve, like a machine had done it. And I was aghast. I was like, Jerry, how do you do that? Because I had been struggling at the same time with much easier tasks. I was drawing uh, instructional guides for propane tanks where they had to have clean lines and artwork, but I never have been, I've actually never had very steady hands. I was always a better painter than I was a line artist. 
but it was such a struggle for me to produce that clean artwork we needed to. I said, Jerry, how'd you do that? And he said, oh, well, he was about 55 at the time. He said, well, I was working on it about an hour a day, every day since I was in my 20s. And it clicked about two or three years ago for me. And I thought to myself, there's a big lesson here um, because I knew I wasn't going to have that much time to get to his level and be you know, a profitable artist or someone who could support myself with my illustrations. So it made me really embrace finding new ways to do things. Sometimes that's physical, sometimes that's on the computer, but learning that lesson from him that times have changed and the things you could do to build up your skills while still being very employable, those opportunities don't exist now. You have to be as good as the best people right away. You know, I'm not saying you should take shortcuts. I think as artists, we have to sit back and be cognizant of, you know, how can I make time? How can I make myself, you know, a profitable artist? How can I make a living at this? How can I compete with the best people out there? Because the field's crowded and that's especially true of comics. I think we all have to, to look at things in that way. So that's, I think the best piece of advice uh, that I ever got about art. So what's the second best piece of advice? Second best. Uh, well, it's not anything I've heard, you know, specifically said to me, but I've read uh, in one of my comic, you know, drawing comics books was a quote, I think is attributed to Joe Kubert saying, you know, do your best, but move on to the next one. There's always the next panel. So that's, that's something that's always in my mind too, because I can get held up drawing one panel over and over again for days. And then realize, oh, now I'm behind schedule and, and that's a whole mess too. So I'd say that's the second best of advice I've come across, put it that way. Nice love. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I would say the person that really inspired me as an artist was Al Williamson. He was a Star Wars artist mainly. He drew a lot of Flash Gordon, did some work for Marvel, is also pretty famous for inking Rick Leonardi and uh, John Romita Jr. I came across his work when I was pretty young and it was also about the time I would have been a lot more apt to be looking at Jim Lee and Joe Mataria. But something about that guy's work spoke to me. It was dignified, heroic, and told a story in you know the best way. I thought it captured everything you wanted to see in an adventure story. And even though I don't necessarily draw like him, those books are never far from my desk. And uh, that approach to really look for the heroic side of things wherever possible while telling stories about rounded characters is my biggest inspiration. It has been since I was very young. From a professional standpoint, you have been a graphic designer and comic book creator for many years, and you have, of course, many successful campaigns and projects uh, that you've done in the past and currently that you're creating now. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I think so. I would say that's, I, I do. I certainly don't think that there's, I certainly haven't plateaued in any way. I'm not close to where I want to be, but I think if it, you know, I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I'd be happy that I was continuing to do what I wanted to do. I think that to me, it's important that I never stop trying to do this, that as long as I was continuing to make the effort, I was going to be pretty happy with that. It's been really nice these last few years. I've been getting a lot more attention for a long time. And I think every artist goes through this. You feel like you're shouting into the void. And that was certainly the case for a long time. But even though I've kind of turned a corner these last few years, I was still happy then. I still felt I was, as long as I was trying, getting better, kept banging on the door of comics, so to speak, I was pretty happy with that. And I still am. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I'm usually sad for a day or two and I figure out to do a different thing. I've been lucky that I can do things myself so I can move to a different project if I want to and reassess the one that failed at a later time or not at all. I don't have to sort of say, oh, now I have to find a whole new team or rebuild this connection or any of that stuff. Logistically, I'd say it's pretty easy for me to pick myself up and get back in there, uh, which you know I'm lucky to have that option. As far as it being letting go of things, there's a lot of stories that have taken a long time to work out that I probably should have let go of and spent a lot of time just trying to rework and rework and rework. So sometimes I do that and it pays off and often doesn't, but I generally just try again. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer, artist, or a creative person in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? It's a good question. I would say, and this is something that's informed my work, is I've always been very into the tradition of comic book artwork, how Jack Kirby inspired people and then they inspired people. I would say, and this is something I try to do as well, is to really think of my work in, in that continuum, which is to say, 
you're drawing inspiration from the stuff that came before you. You're also not just aping it and you're, you're adding your own thing to it, which is going to pass the baton forward. So I'd say just having that viewpoint that you are here at this moment, but there's been a lot before you, and there will be a lot after you. I think being part of that tradition of comic book artwork and creators is something that I really, I don't know that I'm a part of that tradition in any big way. I'd like to be, I think just having that viewpoint, sort of being a part of that community in that way is what I would say is the best way to look at that. Now the fun question, and, uh, you know, cause we can't be all introspective and, and depressed, you know, at the end of an interview, um, but you gave very joyous, bright answers. So if your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Wow. All right. Soundtrack would be by John Barry. All right. It's the James Bond soundtracks, the older ones at anyhow, but it would be one of the silly eighties ones he did not, which is not say silly, but has an age as well. Title. Boy, I don't know. I would say a little short for a stormtrooper. I'll go with that. <laughs> I'm Italian, so I'm genetically short, so it works out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Benjamin, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You know what? Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is your Zoop campaign and when does it end so that we can help support you that way as well? The campaign is going to end on uh, March 21st, I think. There's about, as of now, there's 29 days left as we're recording this. You can find that at zoop.gg, so zoop.gg, and that's where the campaign is. If you, further on in the future, you'll be able to find me. My campaigns will, I think, be at Zoop. I had such a great experience with them. You can also find me on Twitter at the links below, on Instagram at the link that's also there. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of T-Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or tgeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website because I am only one person. Give me a break. I can only do so much with my day. And that is www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. And the podcast is back after 12 or so years, which you can find at two geeks talking or search for the two geeks talking on your streaming services that are out there. And as I say, every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking.